We are ready to begin our summary of this episode of The Main Actions. Even though I don't really drink, this episode may make you reach for a glass. The time is 10 p.m. The location, Hollis Maternity Hospital, still there, right here on the map. It may surprise you to learn, but Ulysses has been translated into other languages. This episode, among others, is an example, uh, a puzzle to me. How do you translate something like this? I don't know. It's as strange as trying to translate Ulysses to film. It's there's unfilmable parts and there seems to me untranslatable parts, this episode in particular. What you translate like what you film is not really the interesting parts. The amazing parts of Ulysses are these sections that really connect it with the language. Now like those digressions in Cyclops, there is a lot of window dressing in this episode. It is not central to the actions, but there are a lot of great ideas in those uh, the stylistic excursions, and I hope at some point you are able to at least come back in the future and relive them and explore them more. After all, storytelling is more than just action, my friend. We begin, as usual, with confusion. <laughs> we begin with this chant-like uh, introduction that repeats three times, Desho Hollis Ayamas, and this is, according to the annotations, it means, let us go kind of clockwise or to the right. Clockwise, think about the sun, Helios, but let us go rightward to Hollis Street. We're also getting linguistically muddy, I guess you want to say, from the beginning. Adeshal is from Irish and Aamis is from Latin. I don't know what Hollis is from, but at least a few languages all of a sudden Joyce is mixing. The chant-like quality feels like an invocation, a very magical moment, an entryway, a gateway into a new realm. If this episode is the development of a baby, the development of a language, the development of logos into the human mind, we're going to see that it is, uh, it is a magical experience. Is the history of creativity, imagination, invention, is that something that is a path ahead of us or is it something that we're making up as we go along? When the action begins, we get this paragraph about it's really in praise of procreation and the fecundity of the populace. And if it feels really weird English, it's because, according to the annotations, Joyce is... I wouldn't be surprised if Joyce originally wrote this in Latin and then translated it almost directly into English. The problem with that is that Latin, according to... I, I speak a little Latin, but by no means am I Joyce-level fluent. and. My understanding, though, is that word order is much, much more flexible because you may have heard this about Latin, is that there are many, many cases and tenses and that the way that a word, for example, a word like Marcus can be Marcus or Marque or even, I think, Markham. I'm not sure about that, but like basically the, the way that a word is inflected will tell you its role in the sentence. So word order is much more fluid and when you try and translate like a literal uh, direct translation into English it will sound really weird like this. So we drift into this maternity hospital on Hollis Street. It is still there. You can go walk inside and take a look around. It does not look like a modern hospital at all. It looks pretty old-timey and I encourage you to take a look. I think it's one of the least explored uh, places in Ulysses as a tourist attraction because it's still a functioning hospital. It's right near Marion Square on the map. You can see it. But inside, doctors are helping women in that all hardest of woman hour. We learn that some man of Israel's folk has arrived at the hospital. This is, of course, Leopold Bloom. He, you may remember, in Nausicaa was wondering about Mina Purfoy, so he's decided to stop by and check on her to see if the baby has been delivered. The baby has not been delivered, and Mina's been in, uh, in childbirth for like three days, so not a very uh, fun time for her. Of that house, a horn is lord. This refers to Andrew Horn, who, uh, director of the hospital, I believe, he sort of ran things, but 
Coincidentally or not, that horn, another horn reference is showing up. When Bloom arrives, he greets the nurse on duty there and he asks about a doctor that he knew, O'Hare, and the nurse informs him that O'Hare died, I think three years earlier, of belly crab. What belly crab is, the annotations suggest stomach cancer, but somehow he died. This saddens Bloom, of course, and leads to this reflection on death in the style of the medieval morality play, Every Man. Bloom asks about Mina Purfoy, he learns that she's been in labor three days, and he also uh, knows a guy there named Dixon, who is a doctor that helped Bloom once with a bee sting, but the text refers, it, refers to it as a, a dragon. As Bloom talks to the nurse, they hear noise from the waiting room. This is a group of young men, uh, a lot of young medical students, but also among them is Stephen. But these, this group is, they're getting very drunk and they're eating sardines. And Bloom tries to resist, but somehow he gets kind of pulled in by inertia to the group. So he goes to join them for a brief time. They try to get him to drink, but he stealthily pours his alcohol into someone else's cup. The nurse tells them to be quiet because they are getting pretty rowdy. A scream is heard and the men wonder if it's the baby that's been born or if it's the mother screaming. Lenahan, who is among the group, he has this to say, expecting each moment to be here next. Lenahan actually used uh, almost this exact line back in Cyclops, so he is full of humorous cliches. Contrast Lenahan's lack of empathy with Bloom's always aware of woman's woe. Lenahan in this episode, as this older guy hanging out and joking and getting drunk with these younger guys, you know who he reminds me of? John Falstaff from the Shakespeare plays. Let's take a look at who we have here in the waiting room. We have Bloom, of course. Think about why Bloom is actually there. He was looking for some kind of reason to stay out late. Remember, he was going to go and see a play, and uh, that didn't work out, so he ends up going to this hospital. He seems to be really dallying, almost like he doesn't want to have to deal with Molly when he gets home. Maybe he doesn't want to have to confront her and have her make up some lie about her affair with Boylan, so he wants to get home so late that she'll be asleep, perhaps. We have Stephen Dedalus, and the text tells us that he is most drunk of them all. Because Stephen is so drunk, we're going to get some of his greatest and weirdest lines. Uh, I think he's in some ways more interesting drunk than sober. We have this doctor or medical doctor intern Dixon. I'm not really clear if he's drinking with them or if he's just on break, but uh, he seems to kind of be working. We have this guy Punch Costello who is a bit of an enigma to me. I think his full name is Francis Costello, but he uh, you'll hear him referred to as Frank or Francis or Punch Costello. When I heard the name Punch Costello, I thought immediately of Punchinello, which is the anglicized form of this character, uh, Punchinella from Commedia dell'Arte, this uh, old theater form that is this really stock uh, kind of roguish character. You may want to read a little more about him. I'm not sure if Joyce was going for that, but that was what came to my mind. Joyce um, and Bloom describe him as this almost halfway between a, a man and an ape. He, he seems almost inhuman. He's, he's very body and roguish. I think Bloom may dislike him because he seems to represent not uh, reason and compassion, but these these really wild, selfish urges within humanity. There's a guy named Crothers who is from Scotland, who uh, sometimes when the narration is describing the characters, he will just be referred to as this Scottish fellow, as this, this outsider. And that's, I think, the nature of certain eras of text that you're either part of the tribe or you're outside the tribe. And Crothers, is, uh, that's his defining feature as an outsider, that he is uh, this outsider from Scotland. And a lot of times the text will refer to Bloom as an outsider, even though he is not. I mean, he's from Ireland. We have another medical student named William Madden. This is uh, our third Madden name, I think, in the book. Let me just clarify the other Maddens in case these all these maddening references are confusing you. There's O. Madden Burke, the journalist. There's O. Madden, the rider of Scepter, the horse, in the horse race that day. And then there's this William Madden that we're 
seeing in this episode, there's a line somewhere that maddening in its sweetness. I think Joyce was aware that sometimes he does things that are a bit maddening. The Dr. Horn, the guy that runs the hospital, he's not actually shown in the this episode, but here's a picture of him if you want to know. Also that nurse that greeted Bloom earlier, her name is Nurse Callan, and then there's an older nurse named Nurse Quigley. And though they are not yet arrived, Buck Mulligan will show up in a bit along with this guy Alec Bannon, as well as uh, Haynes, he will have a humorous uh, appearance that we'll see in a while. Because they are in this maternity hospital waiting for the pregnancy, I mean, I think they're mainly there to drink, but they, they have something to discuss. So the, the issues of pregnancy, the development of the baby, uh, is approached from a lot of different angles, from kind of the theology, from the legal perspective, from the physical, physiological perspective. They're debating who kind of has precedence if there's danger to the mother or the baby? Who, if, if only one can be saved, who should be saved? They ask Bloom and he, rather than giving an answer, kind of skirts the issue. He, he really does, has no interest in arguing with these drunks. One thing I've kept an eye on as I, I was reading was that it's interesting how in older books, like you go read Beowulf, you go read Gilgamesh or whatever, it's it's very apparent what the narrator thinks of the characters <laughs> like there's no none of this modern literary waffling about um who's bad and who's good or whatever like the narrators will let you know or the bible for example you know who the villains are and who the heroes are and um when characters do things that the narration doesn't approve of it will let you know so too here in most of these uh paragraphs we uh, know clearly what the narrator thinks. I think as a uh, narrating species, we've kind of decided that it's much more interesting not to rub that in your face and rather just to show these characters as they are. So as, as it progresses, I think we're gonna see that less and less. And by the time we get to the end of this episode, it's gonna be pretty much completely gone. As Bloom interacts, the narration uh, tells us, and you may be suspicious about the logic behind this or the the reasoning of how much Bloom actually does feel this way but it, it explains his presence there and the way that he acts and talks with them as trying to help Stephen because of his friendship with Simon and what happens not just in this episode but in the coming episodes what happens through the remainder of the book really his interactions with Stephen so you can take that with a grain of salt or you can uh approach it how you will, but that is what the narration says. Joseph Campbell has come up before in this series. He famously wrote that book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and when you think about the hero's journey and its stages, uh, I, I think of it similar to the stages of pregnancy, which Joyce, in his brief study of medicine, must have been aware of to some degree, and uh, supposedly when he wrote this, he had a, a diagram or a a chart of somehow of the stages of pregnancy before him to keep it aware at all times. But the hero's journey is something similar that it has these stages, but it can get messy and have these obstructions and uh, diversions and unexpected uh, problems along the way. So I think uh, however many stages you have, we can still, I mean, knowing the hero's journey doesn't make stories less interesting. There are still great stories that are being told in whatever media that people uh, explore nowadays, but it's, uh, it's just a, a map, but it, it doesn't show all the possibilities of what can happen. I think when Harriet Shaw Weaver, Joyce's patron, read this episode, I think she compared it to Hades, saying that it may have well been, been called Hades because it was so uh, difficult and painful to read. Maybe Joyce is trying to make a similar connection to childbirth which for Mina Purfoy is probably pretty painful. As I was reading this, I kept thinking about how so much of the language contains um, the relation of the self to the culture, the society, and how um, a person's role in that society is determined largely by the language. When we use language like, um, God have mercy, that when you hear that a lot, it has the implication that one, there is a God capable of having mercy, 
And when the language shifts to other metaphors, other perspectives, it changes how the role of the individual is felt in that society. I think of this episode as a manual of style, and some of these styles, you think of very powerful and widespread books like the King James Bible, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, books that a lot of people didn't have very many books, and if they did, it would be something like one, one or two of these books, or the complete works of Shakespeare, and not like these modern editions with an editor and footnotes and hist uh, variants in the, the text explaining what we think might happen. No, it's just, this is Shakespeare. This is how it is. This is accurate. And same with the Bible. This, this is presented as the word of God handed down and nobody wrote this. It was just written like this. No editors. This is how it came to you. So when people, that's all they have as their worldview. And if you had, you know, the book, the Bible, the works of Shakespeare, that could occupy a person's thoughts for a lifetime. The massive amount of, of not just books, but media resources that we have nowadays is overwhelming. It's easy to see how we don't quite inhabit the same worlds anymore because there are just so many possibilities for exploration. A great line that comes up connecting to Bloom and Nausicaa and him kind of skirting his you know, responsibility to be fruitful and multiply. God possible souls we nightly impossibilize. There's a lot of really wonderful ideas, a lot of wit. Stephen puts forth a really great image about uh, the Virgin Mary being both the daughter of God, but also the mother of God as Jesus. So God the Father being the father of Mary and Mary being the mother of Jesus. It's sort of a reverse Ouroboros image to me, or spontaneous creation, like who came first, the chicken or the egg. This image of creature of her creature also reminds me of that reference to Shakespeare earlier on. Shakespeare, the father of his race, the father of his own grandfather. Costello, Punch Costello gets pretty rowdy and uh, Nurse Quigley comes in at one point telling them to be, to shut up again. They're just so rowdy. They're really like mischievous schoolboys, and as soon as she's gone, they're, they're at it again. You may remember in A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, Stephen was considering uh, a career in the church, and Dixon in this episode is going to ask Stephen, why didn't, why didn't you pursue that? What was going on there? And Stephen's answer is pretty uh, interesting, very, a bit cryptic. Obedience in the womb, chastity in the tomb, but involuntary poverty all his days. He seems to have accepted his, his role as a writer and nothing is really going to steer him away from that. I think that's the, really the conclusion of A Portrait of the Artist, his acceptance as his life as a, an artist, be it poverty or what have you. We also get a lot of reference to Stephen's hoarding. Once again, Costello gets pretty rowdy. Then there's some uh, lightning and thunder, which scares Stephen. It's one of his fears, along with dogs. He doesn't like thunder, so he hears that. And Bloom tries to reassure him, and we get that funny phrase again. It says, oh, it's just a natural phenomenon. The paragraph that talks about a prostitute named Bird in the Hand and all that, that's really taken from, uh, the style is from Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan. 